All right. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Vivian Clay. I work at the University of Osnabrück and uh, study for a PhD there. And I almost visited you guys um, last at the beginning of this year, but uh, didn't work out with the visa. So now I have to talk to you remotely. But I still hope that maybe we can work together on something. Yeah, that, um, absolutely. Yeah. So I'll just give a quick overview of my work and my overarching goal and um, it will be very general in the beginning and then um, I hope that I stay on the best level of detail for you guys so if I'm too general or too specific um, or too fast or too slow just let me know and yeah feel free to interrupt me. Um, all right so I'm looking at uh, learning uh, through embodiment, so learning through interacting with the world. And um, how I got to this is uh, previously I've worked with fully supervised neural networks, which are really good. All right, and, Vivian, I have a question already. So your title of right. your slide says learning sparse representations through embodiment. Is that your goal or did you discover you're doing it or is your goal just learning through, through embodiment? Uh, 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 you know what I'm saying? Yeah, good question. <laughs> Uh, it was not my goal at all. I just wanted to see what is learned when you learn through it, when you learn through interaction. And it just turned out that the representations were sparse without uh, me trying to get them sparse or anything like that, which I thought was. Yeah. Really okay. I just want to be clear because because it's a more far more interesting goal to learn how do you learn representation through embodiment than just sparse representation. So thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So. Uh, conventional neural networks are really good, often better than human performance by now, but they have some drawbacks and some weaknesses. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, adversarial attacks. Um, it's basically when you add some specific noise to an image, really weak noise. So here in this example, it's multiplied by 0 0.007. Uh, you can't even really see the difference between the panda on the left and on the right. Um, but it makes a huge difference to the network because without the noise, it classifies the image as a panda and with the noise, it classifies it with very high confidence as a gibbon, which uh, is a mistake that a human would never make. And the same uh, similar effect you can also see with natural images that you didn't add any noise to, uh, but that just have some low level properties that trick the network. Like for example, the image of the squirrel that's um, misclassified as a sea lion because you can kind of see the texture of this water fountain looks a bit like uh, the texture of a sea lion's skin, but um, the shape is totally different. So a human would never think that there's a sea lion in this picture. Same with um, the picture next to it where the squirrel is classified as a rocking chair. Um, or just some background info like the bees that are classified as hummingbirds just because they are sitting on a hummingbird feeder. And in general, it has been shown that uh, networks seem to have an over-reliance on local image features like texture and don't consider global features like the overall shape and outline of an object enough. And this is a, this is a problem and something that uh, needs to be improved. And to do this, uh, I think it's always a nice idea to look for some inspiration in nature because uh, nature has spent millions of years evolving and sometimes different species have evolved the same solution to the same problem independently, like using sonar to see in the dark. Um, bats have evolved it and dolphins, for example, and uh, then taking it as an inspiration it can be used by humans in submarines, for example. Um, same with uh, wings, the structure of wings being developed in bats and birds, or just the general body shape um, evolving in the same direction for fish, reptiles, and mammals if they are swimming in the water. And so I'm just thinking that using the solutions that evolution came up with doesn't seem like a bad start. So since I'm looking at learning, I took a look at some theories um, of how learning in humans works. And here are Piaget's stages of cognitive development in children. So you can already see from the 
number of years at the bottom that it takes a long time for a human child to really uh, develop to its full potential. And in the beginning, there's just some very weakly su supervised interaction with the world. Sensory motor contingencies are learned. Um, regularities of the world, concepts like object permanence, and so on. And once these representations are learned, they can be associated with um, names and concepts uh, pretty instantaneously, um, associating words to objects, and so on. And then later on in development, children learn that if you have a tall, narrow glass of water, and then you fill the water into a wide, small glass, it is still the same amount of water. I was actually surprised that this is only understood at the age of seven, starting at the age of seven. Um, and yeah, then later on in development, uh, children learn things like deductive and inductive reasoning, uh, hypothetical thinking, and so on. And how we train a lot of machines currently is very different to that. So. First of all, most of the artificial neural networks don't have a body, so they don't interact with the world. Often they get trained on the final task from the beginning on, so there's no gradual easing into the learning. And often um, they are trained fully supervised, so at every instance there's a supervision signal telling the network what is the correct or the wrong answer. And um, I will mainly focus on supervision and embodiment in learning and look at how, uh, how the learning changes if we make them more similar to how humans learn. And for this, I use deep reinforcement learning. Um, and I use the term embodiment in the sense that there is a closed loop between action and perception. So the perception at time t influences which action is taken, and this action then determines what the next perception will be. Um, and in my case, I use a 3D navigation task where the main observations are RGB camera images collected in a simulated 3D maze world. And additionally, a small vector observation telling the agent um, some things about the environment, like how many keys the agent is holding, how much time is left, and the level. And the actions are walking forwards and backwards, turning left and right, uh, jumping or not jumping, and turning the camera left or right. And just to give you a better impression of this, here's a short video. Um, of the agent running through this tower. There are uh, several rooms on each floor. You have to go through the green doors to get to the next room. The yellow doors lead to the next uh, level. Um, blue spheres give more time. Once the time is up, uh, it's game over and the agent has to restart. Sometimes um, agent needs to pick up a key to open a specific door. And later on, um, some puzzles are introduced and even later on enemies and more complex tasks. And the environment is randomly generated, which means that um, the agent can't just memorize the path. I, I have a question about that, Vivian. Why, why, why did you, I'm so, I was just surprised you didn't have a first person camera view, um, which is what I would have expected because that's the agent and that's what the agent be seeing. So it was the level of complexity you were adding this, this um, you know, I don't know, Third person can review and I'm just surprised by that, I'm surprised that worked and, and why you chose that. Yeah, that's uh, not a very good answer I have for that <laughs> because um, this environment, I started using it as part of a challenge. So it was a, a challenge posed by Unity um, and I took part in that challenge and trained that agent for this basically. And since the training takes like about 30 days, um, and it's difficult for the agent to even learn this. Uh, I didn't do it again with the first person camera view. Um, but this is definitely on the list of next things uh, to change um, to use the first person view. It, it definitely made it harder for me to understand how the whole system works because I'm like, well, the camera's changing, the, the 
agents changing, how would it, you know, it's certainly not gonna learn what we typically consider a sensory motor or an embodiment where it's just like, oh, I move my head left, that's what I changed, what I see here. You know, here you have the camera moving and the body moving and it's like, okay. But I got it, you're saying this was a, this was a, a pre-existing challenge. You just took it, took the environment as it was set up. And I guess it's surprising yeah. that it, it still worked. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I just took the environment that they provided for the challenge. Um, and yeah, this is a good, this image is a good example. Like we, right now, we don't actually see what the agent is seeing. Yeah. Right? Like if there's a door in there, because there's some pillars that are kind of obscuring, if there's a green door or a yellow door or whatever beyond it, we don't actually see that right now. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, and, there's, and there's two, and there's two sets of movements. There's the movement of a camera and there's the movement of the agent itself, the, the woman is running through the thing. So is the camera yeah. always in the same relative position to the agent or is it actually moving around relative to the agent? Um, it's moving around relative to the agent. Okay. And the agent yeah. has control over the camera. So different agents learn different policies too. Like I've had agents that like to keep the camera on their left side, others like to keep the camera uh, right <laughs> behind them. It's- uh, But you say like you because it performs better, is that what you mean? Uh, sorry? Is it you mean it performs better when you say it likes to? Do you, do you just get better results? Is that what you mean? Uh, it's just learns that policy like this. I see. I see. So that's just so the observable behavior. So the yeah. agent can control where the camera is. Yeah. To it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, and then in this environment, uh, it's uh, also pretty difficult to solve because the rewards are very sparse. So the agent gets a reward um, when she walks through a door or picks up a key or a blue sphere, which happens in less than 2% of the frames. So it's a very sparse feedback. And um, in order to get this reward, a pretty long action sequence needs to be performed. You know, it, it, it struck me, maybe what's going on here is, you know, the, the, the woman, the, the person, the agent, whatever she is, um, she's always in the center, right? The video you showed, she's always in the center. I wonder mm -hmm. if the system would work just as well without her there at all. I mean, basically just ignore her. Um, yeah. Have her. It basically, then the camera becomes your first person view and that's what you're solving for. Yeah, that uh, I think it would uh, still be uh, pretty easily solvable because having the body there doesn't give any additional yeah, so that's, what, that's what confused me. If you just didn't have the body there, then I'd say, okay, I'm looking first person view of the camera. That's what you're solving for, so got it. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it solves it pretty well. It can reach up to level 10. At, and at that point, some spatial tasks are introduced um, which uh, need some memory to solve them. And the network I'm using is really simplistic and doesn't have any memory at all. So um, this agent right now uh, reaches up until that task shows up. I, uh, I have a, a slightly more sanguine view of, of the thing. If you can imagine a baby um, basically doesn't know how to control its fist and it sees the fist, but but it then it sees its interactions with the rest of the world, and it can move its head around and see the fist relative to that. So you have a body part, if you wish, that you know what the appropriate sensitive position of it is, which is the agent sitting right there, and then it's exploring the world. In in you know there's the where the agent touches something like a key. It's like almost like a tangibility. So I I, I think it is verging on solving a, a, a uh, it's very abstract, but solving a problem of where am I relative to the world and where is my body part relative to the world type of thing. So mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily see it as being totally tangential to, you know, the goal of, of, of basically moving my whole body through the thing. It's like, I've got these two pieces and I'm trying to guide my interaction with it. And you said it develops a policy with how it treats you know where it put the camera relative to its body part if you wish that's part of the scene so i, I still think it's an interesting problem mm. yeah yeah definitely I'm, I'm just it is an interesting problem i'm just pointing out i think the the, the picture of the woman's body there is, is misleading it's just well the, the baby seeing its fist in the scene 
it does it's, give it's, some information. I, I think this network would solve it perfectly the same if it didn't have that picture of the woman there. It's probably just ignoring it because other it basically it's trying to get like the key into that point. And um, and so I, I don't think there's going to be any representation of the body to the camera to the object type of thing. It, it just seems like it would solve the problem completely without her there, which just doesn't make it, it, it uninteresting. Yeah, it, it may it's still interesting. It's, it's, it would actually it's, probably work a little bit better without the body in there because there are probably yeah. different positions of the the body itself is moving, but that movement is not correlated. Yeah. You probably it would just basically learn to to, to, uh, to ignore the body. It's probably what yeah. it learns to do. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, having this perspective uh, is it was really just a practical decision and not. Uh, I don't think it's uh, really helping the agent to see its own body or anything like that. So, or that it makes the question more, more or less interesting. It was just because the environment was given this way and- yeah, It just it was confusing to me because I didn't understand it. Not make <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's not your fault, <laughs> I got it. In my next presentation, I will, I will have a uh, first person view. <laughs> All right, and um, yeah, so what's uh, really impressive uh, about this, I think, additionally, is uh, this network has uh, just 2,000, a bit more than 2,500 neurons and about 3 million uh, synap parameters slash synapses, which is half as many as a neurons as a jellyfish and about a third of the synapses of a fruit fly. And I just wanted to point that out that with such a small network, a uh, pretty complex uh, vision and object recognition tasks together with uh, motor control and navigation can be solved is uh, I think pretty impressive. And we always compare neural networks to human performance, but while giving them much less complexity and resources. So yeah, I just wanted to point that out. And um, also like uh, even cats and dogs who have many, many more neurons don't. <laughs> always learn perfect policies. So. Uh, Marcus, that's what your cat did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, so that's the part to the behavioral aspect of the agent. And now um, to what the agent actually learns and how it represents the world. So. As I said, there's a closed loop between action and perception. So we have the observations going in. They're being encoded by the neural network into an encoded state. This is what I'm mainly looking at, what, what information is in the encoded state. And then this encoded state is used to decide on the next action, with this, which is then executed and determines the next observation. And um, the observations ha have a dimensionality of over 84,000 and the encoded state then contains 256 neurons. So there's uh, quite a lot of dimensionality, just, um, uh, yeah, lower dimensionality. Um, and these 256 neurons that encode the visual input are what I'm mainly looking at. So what was the, um, the encoding? So what kind of CNN or whatever is, is that? Is that a ResNet or something? Or? Uh, it's two convolutional layers followed by two dense layers. Oh wow! Okay. So it's pretty, pretty shallow. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 and, and, and no pooling. Uh, there's pooling between the convolutional layers. There is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but a much deeper network is super difficult to train with uh, reinforcement learning because there's such little feedback to learn from. Right. Okay. So it's essentially a net. Sorry? It's essentially a Lynette uh, network. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so now uh, this encoded state has uh, basically 256 activations uh, with every input image. And I reduced this dimensionality to two using TSNE. Um, just to visualize it. And even after reducing the dimensions down to two, you can still see a lot of, a lot of structure just um, from the action that was performed. So uh, the encoding that the agent learns is uh, very action oriented, um, but also action relevant objects are encoded in the network. 
for example, if you look at the circles that are um, circled red, they all showed an image of a door that leads to the next level. And you can see that they form kind of clusters within the action clusters. So they don't form a single cluster, but um, within the action clusters, which makes sense because the door on the left side, side is uh, something different than a door on the right side and needs to be encoded distinctively for the agent to make the right move to walk through the door. Um, but for example, things like illumination that is not action relevant at all um, seems to be discarded. So if you, for example, look at the um, images on the top left, there's one with a very yellowish light, um, one with not re really much light at all, and one with more greenish light, and they are all um, encoded similarly to each other because they all uh, contain the same type of door in a similar location where the uh, agent needs to walk towards the right side to go through the door. Okay, so that's what the, what the agent learns. Um, now I want to contrast that to, um, to other conditions. Uh, to, they are both not embodied, so they both don't have any interaction with the environment. Um, one is an autoencoder, which is uh, another way to learn self-supervised. Um, the autoencoder is trained with the same images collected in this environment um, with the task to reconstruct the image. And then the second condition is a classifier, which is trained fully supervised and also without any embodiment. And just a short uh, schematic about the structure of these two networks. They basically have the same encoding. So also two convolution layers, two dense layers um, up to the encoded state. They are all three exactly the same, but then they have different tasks. So the Autoencoder uh, then decodes this encoded state and is supposed to reconstruct the input image. And the classifier is supposed to say which objects can be seen in this image and receives uh, labeled data that was annotated by me. And how, oh, so that you, you annotated that manually on the. Uh, almost. I first the... let it annotate it uh, automatically a little bit, but then. Had to go through it by hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and how many objects did you have? What was the um, so uh, five yeah. different types of doors? Then, if there's a time orb or not, if there's a key or not, and if there's a puzzle piece or not. Mm -hmm. So I tried to keep the classification dimensionality the same as the the action branches. So it has equal output dimensionality as the agent. I see. OK, so now for all of them, we look at the encoded state of the same input images. So here we have uh, one run of the agent through the tower. It's 4,000 images. And I give the same 4,000 images to the embodied agent, the autoencoder, and the classifier, and look at the activation in the hidden layer. And this is just one neuron, neuron number one, in this layer. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, autoencoder and classifier neurons are mostly active all the time, but modulate their strength, the strength of the activity. And the agent seems to have more spike-like activation pattern. So most of the time, it's uh, just at zero or slightly below zero. And then sometimes it is, um, uh, has like a spike-like activation. Um, and just for understanding, I use a swish activation function, which is shown on the right. So the activation can range from about minus three, uh, minus 0 0.3 to infinity. And so what so do you mean by normalized activation here? How do you? Uh, just uh, divided by the maximum activation of that neuron. Um, so it uh, looks more comparable between them. OK, but it could be negative. Uh, yeah, it could. So the, the, for example, this pink one, you can see that it goes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so Vivian, um, you said there's no memory in this network, right? So yeah, uh, it's, it's basically processing each image and state, uh, state variable 
independently. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So it's mm. kind of like a, it seems if you watch it, it seems kind of like a fruit fly. Like it doesn't remember it has been in this room before or something. If it sees a door, it walks towards the door. If it doesn't see one, it just looks around, kind of. And if you if it, I'm just curious, how robust is it to certain changes? For example, if I drop the agent in a spot in the room it's never been before. Will it figure out where it is and somehow get back on track, or does it wander around aimlessly till it recognizes something? Um, and also, is it robust to adversarial changes? Like, you know, what if I change the the texture of the walls uh, and so on, something like that? Yeah. So the uh, the environment is randomly generated, so it can't really remember um, a path. Oh, it's oh, it's generated randomly each trial. Yeah. Oh. Also, the texture of the walls can 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 be different in different runs. So it's uh, consistent throughout one level, but it can be a different texture the next level. Um, and I also, after training the agent, tested it um, with different lighting conditions. So for example, turning the light uh, red or purple or yellow, which it has never trained on before. And then the performance definitely drops, drops a bit, but it can still navigate a little bit. Hmm. It's not okay. completely lost. All right. And, and these three different types of uh, mechanisms of learning the representation, do they all work equally well in solving the task itself? Um, it's difficult to compare. Uh, <laughs> because but they can all solve it. Uh, yeah, they, can, can they it. all get reasonably good at solving the task. So Vivian, uh, in the reinforcement learning one, uh, the embodied agent, don't you use the convention of stacking the moving average of four frames as the visual input? Or you only use that frame that the agent is at? Currently, I only use one frame. OK. So there is really even no short-term memory at all. Yeah. The only way it learns temporal uh, dependencies is just um, yeah through the training, basically, because the reward gets uh, back propagated through time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. But yeah, during inference, it has no um, no memory. So, so you're saying essentially that all three of these representations can do the task fine. It's just that when you do the embodied version, for some reason, it learns sparse representations. Yeah. So it's, it's not like it's inherently better to learn sparse representations here. Um, it's just that for some reason, the embodied agent tends to learn these sp <laughs> sparse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Just to that, keep in mind that even though they, they all solve the test, they're solving different tests, right? So it's really difficult yeah. to make that comparison. Well, I, what I'm saying by solving, but it, they can all three uh, learn the whole thing the, the, to navigate these levels. Oh, no, they can't. Like the out encoder just learns to reconstruct and the classifier just learns to classify. Only the embodied agents actually learning a policy. Oh, that was my, oh, so that was my first uh, question. Do they all three work well in the task? And I thought the answer was they all can work well in the task. Yeah, they all work well on their own task. So they all three have a different task to basically com compare what, what effect that has on, on, on the representation learned. So, the, oh, oh, so you didn't use the classifier version to do the actual. Yeah, because uh, there's no there's no uh, movement vector from the classifier version, right? I mean, no, yeah, the, rep exactly. the, the representation is the same. So you could still learn the movement from the representation. Uh, yeah, you could, yeah. could do that. This, you could yeah, train an agent that, on the representations. Yeah, that's what I was wondering is like, um, is, is for to do the full navigation task is this is, do you actually need the sparsity or or not um i guess we don't know because you could represent you could just that they're all exactly identical you could just replace the representation that's learned through embodiment with the one that's represented learned through an autoencoder or, or learned through the classifier and you can mm -hmm. still back propagate through the whole thing you can just leave those weights fixed right yeah uh, that's a good idea to test I've read a paper they showed that uh, it actually helps to enforce sparsity in reinforcement learning agents so that they are better if you have some kind of sparsity uh, loss added into the optimization. But um, yeah, I haven't tried that yet um, how, uh, how easily they can learn a policy on, for example, the autoencoders representation. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, okay, should I move on? Yeah, thanks. All right, uh, so here's just another short clip to show um, you how the activations look in the hidden layer for the agent. So on the right, you can see the image that the agent sees and on the left, the encoding of the visual input and the vector input. And this is just for images of um, doors. Um, and you can see like some, some neurons that are pretty consistently active when there's a door and uh, but also a lot of other um, neurons that fire, but um, it's usually a small portion of the neurons that are active in each frame. And just to quantify it a little bit more, um, here I, it's shown in how many percent of the frames each of the neurons are active. Um, X and Y axis means nothing. It's just because you can't really plot a 256 long vector. So I just reshaped it in a square format. Um, just hope it doesn't confuse. Um, and uh, yeah, in the embodied agent, most neurons are active uh, less than 40% of the time, more around 10 to 20 or 30% of the frames. Um, in the autoencoder, basically all neurons that are not dead are active all the time. And in the classifier, uh, the neurons are active around like 30 to 70 percent of the frames. Uh, just for quant quantifying it a bit, so the embodied agent has on average 12 active neurons in each frame, that's about 5 percent, uh, while autoencoder has about 93 percent active at each frame, and the classifier 68 percent active, and in the agent they are only three neurons that are active in more than 40% of the frames and the most active neuron is active in 68% of the frames. So basically it's like, uh, um, yeah, if you look at all these numbers together, it's like in every frame, there are very few neurons active, but overall almost like a lot of the neurons are used in general, um, but uh, yeah, with distributed uh, unique patterns for the different visual inputs. And um, yeah, similar things have been observed in, in nature. And um, yeah, I think you guys have shown also that it is a very efficient and robust way to encode information. And, and that plus brains tend to, they have mechanisms that make things sparse. So it's, it's enforced, it's not just learned. In your case, you're not enforcing it, you're just saying it's learned, right? And uh, the brains also force it, so. Yeah. Which is an interesting question. I think this is your question, like why did they come out sparse? Yeah, exactly. That's a big question that I've been struggling with for the past months. Like, well, why does this happen? I don't uh, have any regularization for it. I don't enforce it. Uh, I, I, I think, yeah, it might be interesting to try the autoencoder and classifier representations. Maybe you just can't solve the task with those representations. Um, mm. You know, you true, but would that explain why the why it's sparse? Yeah, because yeah, because it, it's if you can't solve it through the dense representations, it it has to find a sparse representation. Oh, all right. So you're saying I said so. That's interesting. So it's like you're saying there's nothing forcing it to be sparse, but it'll just naturally just settle on the sparse representations because that's the only thing that that makes it work. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it'll find a an optimal solution. It's, I guess I don't understand these these neural networks well enough to to know how it is even possible that you train a convolutional neural network and one comes out really sparse and one doesn't. I mean, that's beyond sort of my understanding of these convolutional neural networks. Um, it's just sort of like, so I'm kind of confused by that. The, the only difference here is that like the training signal. So that they're, they have three different training signals. One is if you have the right label or not. One is if you reconstruct the image or not. And one is if you're getting the polish right or not. So I think that difference in the training signal is what uh, it changes the whole training process in such a way that the outcome of one of them is sparse and the outcome of the other two are not sparse. Yeah, I, I, guess I'm, I, I guess I'm missing, I don't have the sort of the interstitial connecting points that say, oh yes, well given this kind of training signal, you would end up with sparse stuff. I just, I just don't know that, I don't understand the bottom. So, um. mm. yeah, so I've done a few control experiments um, like for example, looking if it's because the reward signal is so sparse 
which is not the case that this is the reason. And um, I have some more uh, graphics for that later on, um, but I can also jump there now if you like to already go into a discussion about this, but. <laughs> yeah, I have one, one other, uh, th there are a couple of other papers that have found something similar in the context of continual learning. So there's a, a paper I think came out last year where they're learning, where they, where they use meta learning to learn a representation such that continual learning works well. And they've also found to their surprise that the representations were sparse. Um, you know, and they didn't build in any sparsity in the beginning. So that's another case where for whatever reason, you know, uh, representations came out as, as sparse there. Mm. So it might be an interesting correlation you know, uh, analogous work to what you're doing here. It's very interesting. Yeah. It's like, why, why does it come out that way? Yeah. 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 I think Lucas, you also sent me a paper where they, they found sparse representation just arising in reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. I think you both talk about the same thing that Marta White's uh, work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So sorry if um, anyone's asked this. Uh, already on my internet's occasionally cutting out, but um, yeah, so you mentioned this paper that suggested sparsity improves um, reinforcement or can potentially improve uh, agents and uh, reinforcement learning tasks. Have you had a chance to see if, if you do explicitly regularize for sparsity, uh, if enforcing that improves your agent's performance or um, even further? Uh, um. or yeah, I haven't tested that personally yet. Um, in the paper that uh, that that said that they tested it, um, if it helps to enforce it, and it did help in that case, I'm not sh sure if how much it helps in this environment. But I would be yeah, sure that it helps in some some way. Or or if you could regularize to reduce sparsity, uh, <laughs> if that um, <laughs> if that reduces performance. Yeah, that would be interesting. interesting <laughs> Yeah, you could just put yeah. a K winner take all layer in there. <laughs> yeah. when, when you say uh, the second column, number of neurons used, does that mean you had a large number of, of unused neurons in the uh, embodied agent? That neurons that never became active? Um, yeah. So in this case, they are, um, yeah, 39% uh, that are not active in any of the test frames. But um, once, if I add more test frames, it also, this number increases of the number of neurons used. So it might be that the neurons that were not active in these 8,000 frames, that they are just not receptive to the objects that were, or the textures that were in this test set. So I'm sure um, some of the neurons are just dead and not used at all, but. Yeah, you know. we had a similar sort of experience very early on in our work, and we realized it just, you know, from, from a brain's biological point of view, that's not going to happen. And so we introduced this sort of boosting function that said, you know, if the neuron's not participating, we, 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 we make sure that it does. And um, uh, this is something you might think about. Um, mm. so well, that wouldn't answer your question why it's sparse, but it would say you, you'd probably get better performance. Um, because you don't want 30% of your neurons to be doing nothing. <laughs> so. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe they are not more, more needed to solve this task, uh, but may, it would probably help in the end. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a funny thing to say what's needed. Um, you know, um, <laughs> you could probably do it with fewer neurons, it would still solve the task. It just it would be more mm. robust or, or faster or, you know, learn quicker or whatever it is. If, um, mm. There's no, there's no absolute like, oh, you need so many neurons to solve a particular task. It's like, eh. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And if there's some redundancy, I mean, there's also redundancy in the brain, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. uh, to yeah, we, we don't think of it as redundant. It's, 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 um, it's not like there's neurons are doing the exact same thing and you just lose one. They're, they're all sort of complementary and overlapping. It's, um, it's, it's like a distributed not, code. Yeah, it's a distributed mm -hmm. code. Did you look at the sparsity of weights at all coming in, um, into this unit? I did, but not uh, extensively, and I don't have nice figures for that. <laughs> okay, I'm wondering what that happened, how that works. It doesn't look very nice to plot. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, well, if, if I understand this correct, that, that like the classifier, you're just saying, you're just saying, oh, there's a door, right? But mm. what you really need to know is that this is a door in this particular room on this level or something like that. And so if you just classify doors, you would, you would not have that additional context, if I understand it correctly. Um, but if you're trying to solve the problem, you need that additional context, or at least you would some places, I assume, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, well, like I see this room and it's like, well, it looks like a room on the second floor, but it could be the same room on the fourth floor, but I have different actions based on those rooms. And um, so just from that point of view, when, whenever you add context to a representation, you have the ability, you have the option of including, um, um, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a a more unique representation. So you're, 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 I, I guess I'm arguing here is that representations in the embodied agent example will have be far more unique. You, you, um, you'd have far more things you're recognizing um, because the same image can mean different things in different contexts, depending how many keys mm -hmm. you have, and where, how many points you have, and where, what level you are, and so on. So it doesn't tell me why I would enforce sparsity, but it definitely, that's one of our themes in our work is when you add context, the generally the way the brain does this, it takes a representation and in context, it forms a sparser representation um, than which is some set of a subset of the non-contextual representation. So, so it's natural, I think, if I understood it right, it's natural you would, you would want sparser representations, but I don't know why you get them. <laughs> so mm. uh, it may be obvious to someone else. Yeah, that's actually a really, really interesting explanation for it. Um, I hadn't thought of it this way specifically yet. Um, I have a plot here about um, how the sparsity develops over time. And um, the blue line is the embodied agent. So you can see it already gets sparse pretty much from the beginning on. So that's one of the things that puzzle me a little bit. If it's just, the ex if the exp explanation is just, okay, because we have such a difficult task and you need to know context and all of that, if, if this would already cause it to learn to get more sparse from the beginning on, basically, or, um, yeah, or if no. this would only... Is there any kind of uh, relationship with the performance as the sparsity increases? Like, does, one, does it seem to precede performance increases, or uh, does the sparsity have to, like, reach a threshold before you see much of an improvement in performance here? Um, not really. So also agents that don't perform well get uh, sparse in the beginning. Um, I would have to see again if they like stop getting sparse at some point. That's why they don't don't if that's because they don't learn more if, or if they don't learn more because they stop getting sparser. Um, but uh, you say agents that don't do well. Why why would an agent not do well? Just random. Um, yeah, it's uh, not a super stable process to train these agents and um, sometimes you start a training with exactly the same parameters and it just doesn't learn anything and then sometimes you start it again and it learns to be really good. Mm, that's a very interesting observation. I don't think yeah. I saw that. I don't remember seeing that in your paper. But, um... I think that's a more general observation in deep reinforcement learning. That, yeah. Uh, Is that right? Have a lot of... <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know that. That's is that true? So, so a lot of times these networks just don't settle, and then sometimes they do. In deep reinforcement learning, right? So wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. That seems a pretty big problem. It is. <laughs> it's pretty frustrating if you try to do like a hyperparameter search, and you know that in uh, like fifty percent of the cases, it just randomly doesn't learn anything, and the parameters might be actually good. So is the, is the distri distribution of performance by modal, like some of them just fail and some of them work well, but there's not many in between? Is that, is that the general rule of uh, reinforcement learning in these networks? Or is it sort of evenly distributed? I think it depends on the task, like if there's some kind of, if it's like a continually difficult task or if there's like a, uh, for sure, like in this task, if you once learned that it's good to walk through doors and what a door is, then you can already kind of have like a mm. 
performance. And if you never figure that out, then you're never going to learn anything more. In, in the field of reinforcement learning, have people uh, speculated why they fail so often? Has, has it been in theoretical discussions about why these don't always work well? Yeah. One, one thing is that the main difference between reinforcement learning and supervised learning is that in supervised, the trajectory is fixed. You're always going to see those images. Whereas in reinforcement learning, the trajectory changes. So if you take like a wrong turn, let's say you have a, a two doors as yeah. you start the environment. And if you take a wrong turn in the beginning, you cannot end up with a completely wrong trajectory. And you're not going to see anything useful that's going to lead you to learning. So just the fact that the, the trajectory is different and that impacts learning. That's but it, but it's, it's surprising still, but in the sense like you would think that the learning rate would be slow enough that that even if you made the wrong turn in the beginning, you'd eventually get back on track and they would figure out what was the right turn. And I mean, but you're saying no, once you, once you start down the wrong path, you're dead. <laughs> yeah, you knew in some of the environments that's what happens. You take the wrong path and you're dead or the time ends. So it's usually like, so you have a pressure uh, to, to end the, the problem soon. So that pressure might be time or might be like trapped or something like that. So you, if you take a wrong turn, you may just end up that and then you have to go for the next episode. I never, that's it, I didn't know that. That's a pretty big problem. Yeah, yeah. it's like the, the policy that is trained basically determines uh, the quality of the data that uh, it can use to train itself. So if in the beginning your policy slips into a bad policy, you're not getting good uh, observations to learn from, but it can recover. So I've had trainings where I didn't learn anything for three or four days and it suddenly learned something. So, yeah. It's you say three or four days, that's three or four days of your simulation time? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So these things no, take a long it's, time. It's real time, three or four days. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, I did my master's on uh, Minecraft, and wow, that was, I feel your pain. <laughs> I had <have> more. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, there's some good animations of like, um, there's this task called half cheetah, I think, where you have to like get this cheetah model to like move forward. And for example, it's supposed to like use its legs to run, obviously, but if at the start it learns to flip on its back, then yeah. while it's on its back, it can kind of like jitter on the ground and move yeah. forward. Yeah. So by moving forward by jittering on the ground, it's getting a reward. And so it never, at the start of every iteration, then it, it, the first thing it does is flip on its back because it thinks that's, mm. uh, that's a good thing to do. You know, but, but at least it still solves the problem. I mean, you know, sometimes I find myself, I learn a task, just doing a certain way to do a task. And then someone else comes along later and says, you know, there's a lot easier way of doing that. And I never right. discovered that because I yeah, settle on humans are not immune to. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, it happens of cooking a lot. I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, I could have saved myself a lot of time. Um, but, um, but in this case, I think Vivian's example, it's not even, it's not even solving the problem. It's not solving it poorly. It's not like, you know, the agent's just jumping up and down all the time, but it's just not even solving it. Interesting, yeah. pretty interesting. So Jeff, I know you have to go in about nine minutes, right? Yeah, I, well, um, I have to, so I, yeah, I have this, uh, I hope Vivian knows this, I have this. Yeah, so Vivian, thing. do you have uh, a lot more slides to go through or? <laughs> I mean, the rest uh, of us yeah. could probably stay on a bit longer, but Jeff will need to go in about nine minutes. Yeah. yeah, I went for the presentation earlier and it took me about 30 minutes, but I guess we talked a lot about uh, <laughs> affected, <laughs> some so that, I actually have, have uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah a bit but, more than 10 minutes left but um yeah, yeah. Okay. you guys yeah, continue you can go ahead and jeff will just drop off yeah i'm just gonna have to drop off I, and i do this is more an off. indication of how interested we are in this yeah <laughs> yeah well, I, mean, I, I really don't mind talking a lot about this i, I love these discussions <laughs> yeah because i read the paper and i saw all these things and i had all these questions and i'm just i'm sorry i'm being impatient I'm <laughs> oh, no worries <laughs> The, the, the second part's actually really interesting. So if <laughs> yeah, if you don't mind, I can go like a little bit faster and just try and go to to the second part and uh, yeah. give a short yeah, overview. Of it okay. In the last few minutes. All right. So uh, the next step was to move into the next stage, so the pre-operational stage. So we've seen what uh, what kind of representations are learned just through interaction. Um, and now I want to see if uh, these representations are good enough to be able to do what children can do, namely to um, learn concepts with very few examples. So uh, it's called fast mapping in children that you that they can remember a new word or concept just with one example. 
Um, and then uh, that's what I was going to look at next. And just as a little extra, I took out all external rewards um, to be able to say that the agent really learns self-supervised and doesn't have any external supervision and instead let it learn with curiosity, um, which basically, yeah, it's a little long to explain. I'll skip over it for now. Um, it basically uh, um, has a second network here shown in orange, which tries to predict uh, the next state. And this network tries to predict as good as possible while the action network tries to perform actions that lead to unpredictable observations. In, or and in order to um, see unpredictable observations, you have to take actions that take you, for example, to new rooms. You can't just be staring at the wall all the time because that's perfectly predictable. And just by using curiosity um, as a reward, uh, the agent can actually learn to navigate in this tower as well without external supervision. Um, so that's the only change um, in these results now. And um, I want to look at, uh, so we have an image, we give it to the network, we look at how this is represented, and then I want to associate a semantic label with it. And the first two steps we already have, we have a trained network and can get the representation of the image. And now how can it be associated with a semantic label? Um, and I, uh, I call this fast concept mapping, um, inspired by fast mapping of children. Um, you take n examples of the concept. For example, here I take five examples of the concept level door. So a door that leads to the next level, it's marked by a yellow arrow pointing upwards. And the examples shouldn't be all the same image, of course, they should have a little, they should represent this concept, but they can be also other objects in the image. Uh, the object can be at different positions, different illumination, everything. Uh, you extract the representation in the network of these images. And then I just kind of drew it like uh, a connective uh, circle, uh, kind of uh, with the idea of what fires together, wires together, connecting all the neurons that fire together in response to these images. And then I add up these five connectivity circles. And you can see there's a wide variety of activities, but some of the connections are actually active in um, multiple of the images. And those are the connections that we're interested in because those connections seem to possibly encode this object. So then you take the M strongest connections to define the concept. Here I take the 10 strongest connections and I define the concept um, with the additional uh, information of uh, weights for each connection and the weight is determined by in how many of the five example images this connection is present or active. And then uh, you can do this for as many concepts as you like to extract. Um, for example, here I do it for four different types of doors, keys, uh, and the time orb. And I have all these concepts extracted with five examples each. And in order to do inference, you can then take a new image, look at the activations in the network, and look uh, which of the activations from the concept definition are present in this image. Um, then add up the ones that are present, multiplied by its weights, and that's the evidence that is uh, there for this concept. So here we have 66% evidence for the concept of this yellow door in the new image. And you can do this for the other concepts as well. And here we see we also have enough evidence for the blue time orb, but not enough evidence for the other concepts. So then the classification would be that there is one blue time orb and one yellow level door. And what's cool about this? It works with surprisingly few examples. So here on the x-axis, we have the number of examples ranging from 1 to 50. Um, just as a comparison, um, the purple line shows a fully supervised network that was trained with about 6 million labeled examples. So uh, normally uh, object detection networks need like uh, tens of thousands of labeled examples in order to learn this task. 
um, while the agent already has uh, above chance performance with just one example and the performance increases more and more, the more examples you use to extract the concept. Um, but from the beginning on, it's a lot better than the autoencoder or a random representation. And why should this work? The idea is that in a good encoder, a few examples of a class should already be representative of the overall pattern used to encode this class. So here is a, just an example. Uh, on the left side is the connectivity graph for five examples of a level door, and on the right side, 250 examples of the level door. And in the 250 examples, there are, of course, a lot more different connections present at some point, but the ones that are consistently present in the 250 examples are the same as the ones that are consistently present in the five examples, um, which uh, should be a property of a good encoding that encodes this concept. And here are just uh, examples of the different concepts extracted, and you can see that they are quite different from each other. There's concept overlap in some of them, which is not necessarily a bad thing because, for example, the yellow door and the blue time orb both give additional time to the agent. So it might be that the overlapping, uh, the, the connections that are the same encode um, that uh, this object should be approached and gives additional time. Um, and yeah, you could extract any kind of concept. You can also extract left or right, far away, um, or an open door versus a closed door. And of course, uh, concepts can overlap in some points. Maybe I'm sorry, I have to leave early. Um, so I continue on, uh, and I appreciate you being here. I, I, it's fun talking to you, but I'm sorry I have to leave. So. Oh, no bye. worries. <laughs> OK, all right, bye. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. All right, so what's also cool about this, um, here I added the classifier performance, so not the classifier output layer, but just perform performing the same concept mapping on the classifier encoding with also 1 to 50 examples. And um, the classifier encoding was trained uh, specifically to encode these objects. But still, uh, the agent is almost as good as the classifier to, um, to encode these objects and for them to be extracted with few examples. I'm, I'm uh, confused about that one. So here, the classifier uh, was trained on the same, same labels yeah. that the examples are from. So are these examples from the test set or some other? Um, so the classifier is trained on the same um, same object categories um, and optimizes its uh, rep its hidden layer to classify to uh, to classify these object categories and um, then I look at the hidden layer and the classifier and um, try to extract uh, these objects with the same um, procedure as in the agent where I just take like um, five examples and look which neurons are active together and then um, see how good uh, this can already be extracted from few examples just from the hidden representation. Oh, so you're training a new classifier layer just using the representations that were trained on the, on, yeah. on the classification. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it, yeah. That's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I was also surprised that the agent is almost on the same level as the classifier there. Um, yeah, here is um, a plot of the different um, object categories that I tested. Um, you can see that the agent performs better on objects that are well integrated in its policy. So for example, the level door and the orb uh, work really well to extract while, for example, the concept no door can't be extracted at all. It's even worse than chance performance um, because no door is just um, not really a concept you use for an action policy. Um, so it doesn't seem to be encoded in the representation. So it also can't be extracted. 
can I enter uh, real quick? So, so mm -hmm. last slide, uh, I, I asked to train the new classifier for the embodied agent. But my understanding is that you didn't train a new classifier. You just got those few samples, you label them, and then you learn just through like uh, clustering. So you know that example is close to this example, so it belongs to um, to this class. But there is no actual learning process going on after, right? Uh, yeah, just uh, this concept extraction, like just looking which neurons are active in the um, few examples that are shown, but right. no weight updates or anything like that. Okay. But your weights are, but you, you take the, uh, the, 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 the activations that are most consistent across all the examples and, and those become the weights in some sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's it's just clustering. It's not actually learning, I'd say. I mean, yeah, it's still yeah. learning. It's still learning. It's just not doing back propagation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, in uh, in accuracy, the on average, the agent actually outperforms all other conditions except for the um, the classifier readout layer, which was trained fully supervised, um, like with weights going from each neuron to the output classification. Um, and uh, when taking into account the precision and recall as well, um, the classifier is a little bit better than the agent overall in um, extracting the different concepts out, out of the representation. And this is all for five examples for each concept. Um, also, what's a nice property of this is that you can add as many concept, uh, concepts as you want. So if the concept is encoded in the representation, it can be extracted without retraining or huge amounts of labeled data. So in a fully supervised object recognition network, if you uh, um, train it and then you notice you also want to detect keys, uh, you usually have to retrain the whole network again with this additional object class. While here, if the embodied agent um, encodes keys because they are action relevant, then you can also extract it. Um, uh, one can add some concept logic, like if there's a door, it's just one type of door, not multiple types of doors. Um, and that can either be explicitly defined to improve performance or uh, extracted from concept overlap somehow implicitly. And um, one of my uh, outlook next ideas is to um, bring these concepts, these extracted concepts back into the world and use them for decision making. So basically saying, okay, I teach this agent, this is a Level door showed five examples, and then it can use this concept to make better decisions, and also to do, to refine its representation of this uh, of this concept. So here's just a short demo of the agent running through the world and which concepts are extracted um, from the activations that are shown on the top right. And um, I haven't done this yet, but it's one of the outlooks to see if this improves the action policy and the encoding um, and possibly also to use this as some kind of memory. So telling it which, uh, which kind of concepts were observed in the past, uh, however many frames. So now I'm at the end. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I have a couple of questions uh, just on the second part. You, you, you mentioned this very interesting idea that with uh, with the unsupervised, uh, with the curiosity network learning paradigm, you can learn now new concepts very quickly that you weren't mm -hmm. trained on. Have you tried that at all with, uh, and compared that against the classifier version? Because the, when you're learning the same concept, it looked like the classifier and the past concept mapping, they both work equally well, uh, which was great. Uh, but I wonder if you try on new objects that the classifier was not trained on at all, mm. whether the whether the classifier network would still work reasonably well or not. Yeah, I haven't tried that yet. And the problem is that the environment I'm using only has so many objects. 
Yeah. So, uh, not the super complex environment and doors and keys and time warps are kind of the only objects that there are. So I think to test that, I will have to train an agent in a new environment um, with a bigger variety of objects. Um, the only thing I can, um, I'm thinking about testing is to extract different types of concepts, like if a door is open or closed, and mm -hmm. uh, if a door is on the left or on the right side, for example, and then compare that to uh, the classifier. Yeah. Could you, would you mind walking through the curiosity network architecture? I think that went kind of fast and I didn't oh, yeah, really understand that. In. It was super fast. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that one, yeah. What's going on here? All right, so um, the green part is the normal part of the reinforcement yeah. learning edge that is usually just trained with rewards from the environment. And then we have the orange part, which is um, also an encoding of the observations. So the observation is again encoded um, similar to the green part into an encoded state. And then it has two different tasks. One task is to use the current, uh, encoded current state and the encoded next state to say which action was performed in between these two states. And that is then compared to the actual action that was performed and is called the inverse loss. And mm. the task is uh, to use the encoded state plus the action that is performed to predict what will be the next state. So if I am here, I perform this action, where will I be next? And um, that is then the forward loss. And those two losses are then used to optimize the orange network and also used as rewards for the green network. Okay, that's interesting. That's a little different than, um, so some of the stuff we've done and also in the, the biology, there's like, um, uh, th there's something called there's something an efference copy, copy, where the the action you're about to perform is also fed into the system, and so mm -hmm. you can use the the action you're about to do to predict the next state. So instead of predicting the next action, you would predict the next state uh, based on the action. So that's another mm -hmm. you could kind of flip yeah, this around. And, uh, that's the the forward loss task. So. Um, the forward loss task is to use the current state plus the current action and predict the next state. Okay, yeah. but it doesn't get the current action as input, does it? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, that orange arrow that uh, points down to the from the oh, okay. Okay. predicted next state. Yeah, and then the inverse loss is basically used because we use encodings to make these predictions and not the original observations. So we're working in encoding space and, and um, adding the second task of predicting the action makes sure that, um, that the encoding um, is meaningful and actually contains action information. So if, it, if it's got the action as input, why is it trying to predict, why does it also have the predicted next action as input? Um, I think the arrows are a little confusing. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, so the that's uh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. That error from predicted next action to predicted next state is not supposed to be there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Good catch. <laughs> um, that was a super interesting talk. One thing I was wondering. Um, and again, sorry if you mentioned this and it just cut out when, when you did, but um, could you do anything almost like a concept arithmetic, do you think where like, because you mentioned that, um, for example, like blue, the blue ball and the yellow door seem to share some representational overlap because they kind of give time. Mm -hmm. But then presumably maybe the doors share some representational overlap as well. So if mm -hmm. like non-yellow door plus blue ball gives a representation that's similar to a yellow door. And if that could kind of be used to generalize to novel, like novel combinations of uh, representations or something. Yeah, so um, I'm thinking about that and I haven't really formally tested it yet. 
that would basically be my step when I try and move on to the concrete operational stage, I guess. Um, okay, right. Uh, currently, I'm still in the pre-operational stage, <laughs> very early in the pre-operational stage, so I haven't been <laughs> into um, more complex uh, concept logic yet. <laughs> I have a similar question. Could you go to the slide where you're showing Boolean combinations amongst the uh, 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 classifications? The and or. Which slide was that? We had an, uh, and or operations amongst the classifications. Yeah. Here. Yeah. So I'm just kind of curious. You, you say you haven't moved on to that that stage yet but when you did that and operation uh was there commonality that abstracted out of there i mean if you literally did those and operations you know in some sort of you know numerical um, sense yeah so i i only use this very very simplistically in in this video that i said that um for key and orb, it has to be above a certain probability to be detected. And then for the doors, it takes the most probable um, door. And if, uh, also no door, it can't say no door and another door. So that it just looks which is most probable and above the probability threshold. And that's the only place where I use this uh, pretty logic. So uh, it would take, for when you move to the, the kind of conceptual thing, uh, the notion of saying what the com what the commonality of the network is like if I look you know do ands across all the door representations does is there a sub network that kind of uh, you know abstracts out you haven't reached that stage yet oh uh, no okay I was just curious yeah here um, this is uh, things that I'm uh, looking for next so one is a big question with sparsity how, where does it come from and does it help with concept extraction and all this? Then adding memory to the agent and what effect that would have. And then um, also concept relations and logical reasoning um, and the concept overlap and so on. Those are like my big three questions, I guess. Yeah. What, what do you mean by memory exactly? What would be an example? Um, like uh, how I'm imagining it. Uh, imagining it right now is to give the agent um, information about which concepts it saw in the past 10 or so frames to help make the next action decision. And I'm hoping that if I add memory to the agent that uh, it can then learn to solve the puzzles, for example, and um, navigate more effic efficiently. Yeah, I guess it it would have to be a task where where the the the, the past actually does make a difference. It's not uh, purely a first order task where you can look at the current yeah state so and that's all you need. The the puzzle where it uh, fails at the moment, um, the task is to basically push a block onto a, a colored field on the ground, and in order to do this, the agent has to like push the block and then move around the block and push it from another direction. And once it moves around the block, it, it loses it out of sight and forgets about it. And like it can't, mm -hmm. okay, now I'm going to walk around the block and push it from the other direction. Um, mm -hmm. So in Piaget's sense, uh, the object that gets obscured uh, disappears from the universe. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't, it hasn't learned object permanence yet. <laughs> or it can't <laughs> because it doesn't have a memory. Uh, Brian, uh, I have a very basic question. I don't know if it's clear to everyone. So can you go back to that slide where you introduced the circle showing the connections? Yeah, so what, yeah, that, that circle. So, or any of them, <laughs> what exactly are we looking at here? So you have this circle that shows a connection between a 256 embedding to another 256 embedding, right? Uh, yeah, so the circles, um, are the small circles around the big circle, like the blue ones, are basically the 256 neurons in the embedding. Mm -hmm. 
that I previously reshaped into the square format that now I, now I put them in the circle. Mm -hmm. um, and the color of it shows in how many of the 250 examples it is uh, active. And uh, the connections, uh, the strength of the connection shows in how many of the 250 examples these two neurons fire together. Or not really fired, but their activation was above uh, the threshold. Okay. Uh, can you go back one slide more then, please? Oh, no, another one. Uh, yeah, that, so that, that one. So that's a single frame or not. So in that circle, what, what does the connection mean? Uh, in the in for one single frame, it's pretty trivially just a connection from each active neuron to each other active neuron. Okay, so in the architecture, is that in the last? So is that from the uh, second to last to the last layer? I'm still a little bit confused there. Yeah. So basically, um, for example, the first image. Um, is given to the network and then I look at the, so it goes through the convolutional layers to through two dense layers. And then um, the activations of the second dense layer are the ones that I use to um, decide the actions on. So I look at this, those activations. And for example, for this first image, there are one, two, three, four, five, six active neurons mm -hmm. uh, when this image is shown. And then I just draw connections from each of the six neurons to each of the other five. Uh, so I have a question about that one first image. So these are supposed to be cliques, right? Uh, Graph theory cliques, where they're all connected together. So, yes. so if I look at the, from the bottom, uh, the one to third one over, um, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing a connection from there to much of the rest of the network. Uh, yeah, I think that the thing is, these are not actual connections, right? These are activations, two different images. These are co-occurrences of activations. Yeah, it's more co-occurrences than really connections. Um, it's just uh, visualized as a connection. Basically. Right, but I'm, I'm seeing missing arcs, and that's why I was trying to understand what when you said each one's connected to each other i'm not seeing that uh, just in the in the yellow ones so just for the single images yeah that's and i'm looking at the first one and i'm like mm -hmm. i said if you take the third illuminated circle starting from the bottom and you look at the arcs drawn from that it's got arcs to two of the points but no others i think it's just uh, pretty difficult to see i don't know if i can zoom in but um, there's like a connection here on the bottom. Oh, okay, okay. So it, it, it actually, okay, it, 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 the thickness of the circles obscured it. Got it. Yeah, okay. exactly. So the, it's, I, I think graph there, when you have everything connected to each other, it's called a clique. So that's, that's why. Oh, I was, okay. I was, uh, sorry, I didn't know that term at all. So I was a little confused. <laughs> okay. So, so all right, thank you, you. When we talk about weights, there is actually like a, a correlation measure. It's not the actual neural network weights, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a better way to put it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I just called it weights because um, that's the number that I weigh this connect connection mm -hmm. with um, when I sum up the number of connections that are present for the evidence. Yeah, you could also show like a covariance matrix or a correlation matrix or something like that. Yeah. Nice. Cool. cool. That's great. <laughs> it's very thought provoking, Vivian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it is. I also really like the way so, you laid out the stages of development. Um, you know, in the very beginning, I didn't want to interrupt you there, but I thought that was a great explanation and motivation for you know, the whole thing. Um, Thank you. That's yeah, so I put a few more slides in the end just about the sparsity, but I don't know like um, how long your meeting usually lasts and how much more you want to like discuss about this, but yeah. <laughs>
I think we have some time, right? So the... Yeah, we have a few more minutes. Uh, how does it? Can, can I ask a, a quick question before we go there? Uh, so the paper you share only covers the first part, right? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. You have any uh, thing on the second that you can share with the team or not yet? Um, I have a paper draft for it, um, but I haven't submitted it anywhere yet or um, really finished the draft yet. So, I mean, I can share the draft, but it's really rough. Oh, that's okay. I mean, just uh, just asking. Don't, you don't have to share it if you don't want it. It's not ready yet. Maybe in like one or two weeks, <laughs> so. we'll be ready to and, share. <laughs> and, and the paper you did share, is that published or is it just submitted right now? Uh, it's submitted. It's... Uh, except with a few final changes. <laughs> okay. So it so should... you mentioned some parts of this you didn't want to be shared outward. Uh, I didn't hear you raising flags to say stop recording anywhere. So I'm just kind of curious if there's anything. You want I to think add. we'll do oh. that as a post process if there is anything. Yeah, I just had like just of the motive, a few of the pictures in the beginning for the motivation, like the co-evolution images, I just took off the internet and I'm not sure if they have co copyright on them or not. That's fine. I think it's probably fine for this. Right. <laughs> just, just the research A lot of people know. do that. All right. <laughs> yeah, then it should be no problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, should I go over, over a few of the sparsity plots? Sure. Yeah. OK. So um, mo most of them, just to preface it, I only run once and I know that usually you should run experiments multiple times to really know, know it, but it's just there were so many things to run and each of them take a couple of days to run. So didn't have time to really do multiple runs. Um, but yeah, so uh, the question is where does the sparsity come from? Um, and first I tested if it is uh, just because of the task so because I'm predicting actions, maybe predicting actions is a certain kind of task that enforces this. So to test it, I trained a supervised network to predict the agent's actions. And it gets, uh, yeah, it learns to predict the actions, but um, the, the Gini index, which I use to measure sparsity, um, doesn't increase. So um, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with the Gini index, but um, a Gini index of zero is basically the lowest sparsity and um, one is the highest sparsity or 100%. Um, so it doesn't seem to be the task of predicting actions. Um, then maybe it is the sparse or uninformative rewards. Um, to test that, I trained an agent um, to get a reward whenever it would make the take the same actions that an um, already trained agent would take. So take the, the finished trained agent and then a new agent and the new agent takes an action. And if it is the same action that the trained agent would have taken, it gets a reward. Um, and no matter if they are also external rewards or not, it still doesn't, uh, it hmm. still gets uh, sparse. So in this case, the supervised agent gets a reward on every time step? Yeah. And it still gets uh, sparse representations. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And also in the curious agent, it gets a curiosity reward at every time step. It's just a little less informative reward. It just tells mm -hmm. it bad the curiosity network was at predicting. Um, yeah, so the sparse and uninformative rewards don't seem to be the cause of it getting sparse. Um, then I wondered, maybe it's the shift in input distribution that in the beginning it just sees one room and then the input distribution changes um, with the policy changing. Um, and to check it, I once trained an agent that only has the first floor available to it, so very small environment. And then um, one that just uses a random policy to collect its observations. And both of them um, increase in sparsity from the beginning on. So that also doesn't seem to be the case. 
um, then I thought maybe it's because I'm optimizing two objectives, the actions and the value estimate on one representation. Um, but um, also when using two separate representations for those two outputs, um, it still gets um, about equally sparse as when using one representation. And uh, the last uh, idea I tested was if it's maybe some hyperparameter. So for example, um, there's um, the entropy over the action probabilities is included in the loss function. And if entropy is in the loss function, it may propagate back through the network and influence the entropy there. But um, also excluding this parameter seems to make no difference um, to the sparsity. So, so far, I only found things that don't seem to be the cause of bars. <laughs> and uh, it's a little frustrating, but um, maybe you have any ideas what could be other causes, or I will just have to run some more experiments and see. But it seems to look that it's really somewhere in the reinforcement learning optimization algorithm that is causing this. Well, in, in the, but in the supervised case, that was just pure supervised learning, right? Uh, there's no reinforcement learning there. Uh, no, there's the same reinforcement learning algorithm used. So it's just, um, it's not like uh, there's like a label comparison and then the difference is back propagated. It's still used as a reward signal. Um, oh, oh, so I wonder if you could do that in, in the supervised case, since you know what the correct action is, you could just treat that as a label and yeah, that's, that's basically what I did here, and there it didn't get sparse, so. Okay. No, but here. So this one is a supervised network, just uh, trying to predict the agent's actions, and um, there it's really like the difference between predicted and actual action is compared. Okay. And here, uh, I see. So you think somehow the reinforcement learning reward is incorporating some sort of a regularization that encourages sparsity? Possibly. Like, I mean, so far every hypothesis I had turned out to be false, so I wouldn't bet on it, but it's one of the explanations that are still open to be tested. But you're just looking at activation sparsity. You said you haven't looked at the weight sparsities in these cases, right? Uh, yeah. There might be something there to look at. Yeah, it's difficult to quantify this because the weight can be, yeah, I guess I would have to look at all the weights of all the layers together. Um, well, if, if you're trying to reduce it to a single number, yes, uh, but it could be because we, we've shown or there's usually there's a significance. Sparsity contributes to accuracy at different, uh, at different stages of, of processing the layers. So you can maybe tease that apart and just get a sparsity index for each of the layers. But I'm also just wondering if there's anything structurally which is going on on the weights, whether they're just, you know, totally random, you know, if the sparsity appears, if it's random, or if there is some kind of structural uh, aspect to it as well. Mm, yeah, I would have to look at that in more detail. Yeah, particularly for the earlier layers where you, you basically do have uh, spatial coherence going on. Uh, there might mm. be some organization going on there. But yeah. if, if the weights become concentrated, then it would kind of follow that some of the activations would follow along those lines too. Mm. They might entrain each other. So just a thought. Yeah, yeah, definitely a good idea. Is there, um, I haven't thought to uh, like how you would actually do this, but is there some sort of really toy task you could do that you try and solve with both, uh, with either reinforcement learning or supervised learning, uh, just you end like with a shallow uh, MLP or something, 
and just see whether that you see a difference in sparsity there if it's just how intrinsic it is to like uh, a yeah loss or... get a bachelor student to look at that right now <laughs> but uh yeah that's uh, also another another idea to just look at the very okay, nice. <laughs> reinforcement learning environment and just look if it's like just the reinforcement learning algorithm without all the complexities of the environment. Especially because it right. takes right. Long to run experiments in this environment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Why does it take so long? Why is it uh, 30 days worth uh, to learn the full thing? Um, for one, the environment has to be simulated the whole time. So it's not like oh. you have a data set and you can just use big batches and run them through really fast. Um, and then, yeah, I think that that's the, that's the part that just takes the longest to actually let the uh, agent run around there and uh, collect its observations. Oh, so that's the bottleneck. It's just the, the unity or whatever to render the image. Yeah, and a... then also the agent has a very sparse and uninformative reward signal to learn from. So it mm -hmm. gets a, in the in the supervised condition, it gets a reward in less than two percent of the frames, and even there, it just gets told this is the last few actions that you took seem to be kind of good, but um, not really. Like in this case, you should take this action, like a supervised network would get as to learn from. What's the resolution of the images that you're feeding in? Uh, 168 times 168 and RGB, so times three. So okay. over, uh, over 80,000 pixels, uh, over 80,000 values. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, as, a, as an abstraction, um, if you could boil that down to, you know, a pixel represents a door, a pixel represents the orb or something like that. So that you just numerically can scale the whole problem down in some capacity. Mm, yeah, that, that should definitely be possible. I think it would be easier to just take a simpler um, reinforcement learning environment that's like a 2D task or something where you already know that it can be solved. Um, to break this one down this much, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely yeah. makes sense to use something more simplistic. There might be a if you're using Unity, there might be other parameters in Unity which could suddenly make the rendering much faster. Like maybe the fidelity of the textures doesn't have to be that high, or the quality of the lighting doesn't have to be quite as high. And there could yeah. be things like that which could really speed up the, but the rendering. That, that the environment was like for a challenge that you need to put forward. So it was, since everyone was competing in the challenge, I think they kind of fixed those. Um, yeah. 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 Cause, so when cause I was it, training it, I couldn't do anything with it, but now they released like the source version of it. So you can really play with it and change things around. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, cool. I have a hypothesis. So on the, the sparse uh, representation, so it seems like you concluded that the, the difference that the weak signal is induced in sparse representation. That's kind of my takeaway from that. And I was wondering, and maybe you have tried that. I think you, you talk about entropy at some point. Uh, if we have supervised learning, but with a weak signal, you say like you, you just move out the distribution, you, you add some noise there and you have a, a very weak learning signal. Uh, is that gonna lead us to sparse as well? Have you tried uh, something like that? Mm, yeah, the only thing you tried, if I understand your question correctly, with um, changing the reward signal is uh, these two experiments where I give a reward at every time frame, telling it if the action was correct or wrong. Mm. Well, but th that's still a weak signal. Just the fact that you have a reward and not a label, it's still a weak signal. So uh, mm -hmm. I feel like the other way around. So instead of, um, you, you can have the reward per frame, so that would help. But you also tweak mm -hmm. supervised learning in such a way that the signal is weaker. So if you can like, smooth the distribution or you can inject some noise there. So you still have some learning signal, but not as strong as traditional supervised learning. 
And that will make mm, uh, a fair comparison. You mean, you mean basically when training the classifier to use a weaker signal? Yeah, to use a weak, weaker signal. You can just move the distribution and just add noise. Mm -hmm. that will be weaker. Because uh, maybe that's what, what's inducing the sparse is the fact that you have to learn to weak, uh, weaker signal. And I think what's... Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I actually tried adding noise in the classifier labels or just saying it was correct or wrong, not saying what would have been the right label. Mm. Um, and it didn't uh, increase the sparsity, but I wouldn't exclude this explanation because I, it could be the, the type of noise that I added. Um, but yeah, I, I actually tested it a little bit in this direction. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. I <laughs> mean, very well, thought provoking. You. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, coming. And uh, I know it's quite late for you now. And I think, uh, but maybe we can problem. continue this conversation uh, and, and figure out maybe some way to collaborate or some way to do something here together. That'd be great. Yeah, that would be really great. Uh, and thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed um, all the talking about this and uh, all your ideas and questions. Yeah. Do, do we have time like for one final question? Like anyone? <laughs> I don't have any. I'm just anyone in my time. Okay. So let me stop recording.